Welcome back to the Michael Arts' Show, the special edition of the Michael Arts' Show, live from the John Stark Celebrity Golf Classic in Greenwich, Connecticut, to raise money for the John Starks Foundation. I've got a very special guest with me for you guys, the Terrifics. Greg Anthony's joining us. Thank you so much for joining my us. My pleasure. My pleasure. It's great to have you here. Um, you and John were young guys when yeah. Charles Oakley uh, was a vet on the team, and, and we had him do something called Oak in the Kitchen, and he cooked for you guys oh. sometimes? Oak is a, an unbelievable cook, very particular about his food, too. Uh, uh, you know, if you ever went out to dinner with Charles, he is very difficult to satisfy. So if he says something's really good, it is really good. It, and he knows his way around the kitchen, no doubt about it. Uh, cooked many a meals for myself and a bunch of the guys. Uh, I remember going and spending time at his mother's house in Cleveland when, whenever we'd go play the Cavs. And, They'd have a big shindig for us, and he would be right there in the midst of it with his apron on, cooking the, the, the bulk of the meats and what have you. So, uh, yeah, a lot of fond memories hanging out with the big fella. That must have been wild. When you're a young guy on the team and you're imagining we're going to go out every night, yeah. we're going to have steakhouses, you go into Cleveland, you're like, what's the best steakhouse? And the next thing, we're going to Oak's house. Well, and that was the best steakhouse oftentimes, <laughs> you know, just going over there and having dinner. It's funny, too, because you're right. Like, you, you have this preconceived notion when you come into the league of how it's going to be, but we were fortunate playing alongside a guy like Charles Oakley and Patrick Ewing because they were consummate professionals. Those guys spent, you know, infinite amount of hours in the gym, off season, during the season, honing their craft. And it was, they were really good mentors in that respect uh, for young guys because you do have to figure out how to be a pro. I, I don't care how much you played in college or how much experience you had. Uh, nothing really prepares you for the professional level at, at any sport. I think a lot of times, unfortunately, that doesn't happen. Um, but you were lucky enough to have it happen. I, I, one guy once told me um, that he had Junior Seau playing in front of him, and Junior pulled him aside. They were playing golf, and, and, and Junior was betting with the guys a lot, like pretty heavily. And this guy says, oh, I'll, I'll go in 10 grand on this hole. And Junior pulled him aside and said, no, 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 you don't make that kind of money yet. Save your money, do yeah. it right. And then, like, really took him under his wing after that. I thought that that was super interesting. And so I think it's great that you, uh, that these guys, you know, Oak and Ewing, uh, were, were so great to you guys. Um, it must have been amazing playing with those guys and having them be leaders and, and teach you the way of the NBA. No doubt about it. And then also playing for a Hall of Fame coach like, like Pat Riley. You know, Jeff Van Gundy was on that staff as well. Did you ever uh, kid him about his hair? I used Jeff to have, I, <laughs> or Pat. No, Pat. <laughs> no, I've currently got a haircut like Jeff. I used to have a haircut like Pat. Yeah, that was well, a actually, popular haircut. Jeff back should in get a haircut like you and I, but he's <laughs> he, he holding should. on for dear life. Uh, but you're, but you're Pat, right. Pat was always, you know, as suave and, and debonair as he's always uh, comes across on air when you yeah. when you see him. I mean, he is laser like in his focus, uh, very passionate about everything he does. And I think that's one reason why he's been so successful at every level uh, of the game. Uh, and, you know, we, we never really teased him, but, you know, we were kind of in awe of Pat Riley. I grew up during that era where it was the Lakers and the Celtics and the Sixers were really good back then. And so you you know, you got to live through Showtime, and I'm from the West Coast, so following the Lakers, man, it was like you were in awe. Yeah. You know, when I first got the chance to meet Pat Riley, I almost wet my pants. You know, I was like, just like, wow, this is really Pat Riley. I started painting him, and uh, but it was a cool experience. Having said that, though, I wasn't in awe long because he was serious about the game and about trying to accomplish all you could within it. I, I can imagine you couldn't have been in all along because he probably had you running halfway up the court and back and halfway up the court and back oh. and, and all sorts of stuff. You guys played some of the most amazing matchups ever, uh, the Pacers series, mm -hmm. series yeah. the Bulls. Um, it was pretty incredible. And does it mean a lot to you when people talk about last year that there was this thing going around that LeBron couldn't have made it in the in the 90s and in, in the NBA and he couldn't have played against those Knicks teams and I think that that's not true I, I say look LeBron just would have played a different style he would yeah. have been a different player but he's bigger I think he's he's bigger maybe than anybody uh, back then as far as physical mass not he's not taller than anybody but he's he's a block but I do love and and people love and miss and respect the the 90s Knicks mm -hmm. so much um, I mean to be part of that must be something really spectacular it, you know it's I always equate it to what I experienced in college. When you're in the midst of it, uh, you don't always have perspective because you're so in the moment and so in the now uh, that you don't really think about those things. You know, all you, you're focused on is trying to beat that team on the other side of the court. Uh, as you get older and you get removed from it, you, you start to see the historical Im implications of 
what you were a part of, and then you get a little bit more appreciation for it. But I think that's the same for everyone. And, and to your point about LeBron, look, the truly greats of any sport in any era would transcend. Um, they, they just would because a part of, remember, people like to take who that person is and then pigeonhole them into that era. Well, they would have grown up in that era. So they would have played the same style, had the same philosophy. Of course. Um, so he, LeBron James, one of the greatest athletes, uh, best minds of a professional athlete you're ever going to see. He would have been successful no matter what era, uh, just like Michael Jordan would have and Patrick Absolutely. Ewing and a lot of these I, I never great understand what we, we want to say, oh, like uh, Muhammad Ali would have beat Mike Tyson. It would have been no contest. Or we want to compare Babe Ruth to Barry Bonds. You, first of all, you can't. It's, right, it's right. impossible. Um, and second of all, it, it, it makes no sense. And you can have guys who were just great in their error yeah. and who were amazing. And, and I think that that's, that's what's remarkable. And, and you guys as a team were amazing. But I think it goes back to what you were saying about Oak and Ewing and their leadership because it seems like you guys bonded like teams don't necessarily do this anymore. I mean, you, you all went to Oakley's house for mm -hmm. food. Uh, they took you into the training room mm -hmm. and, they, and they worked you and they, and they took you under their wings as mentors and taught, taught you how to be professionals. And I think that, to me, is, am, am, I, am I right here that it really had a lot to do with that and how you bonded as a team? Because you, you really, especially the, the fight on the court. It, it, you're exactly right. Uh, but I think that permeates all team sports. I mean, because ultimately, those are lessons you learn when you're in middle school, right? You know, the first thing you learn in your team is your family. And so, you know, like families have disagreements and spats, teams do as well but you never personalize those things. And it's the same with teams. I mean, you, you know, you look at today's era, you know, LeBron's got all the guys coming to Miami to work out. I know uh, Steph Curry and, and those guys are doing the same thing with, with the Warriors. All these teams do that. They have, you, you don't always hear about it because it isn't sexy, Yeah. but all great teams have those bonds. They have those relationships that allow them to play for one another. And that's what at times separates good from great is that bond and, and we were fortunate enough to have it but a lot of great teams have always kind of uh, displayed that on their their path towards trying to win a championship you, you brought up steph curry you ever you ever notice that he seems angry every time he scores he does this, <laughs> it's, you know i want that like you know excited well, fist pump. If, he's if like, he shot it like that i don't know yeah. why you would be angry right <laughs> i mean maybe he was thinking about a shot he missed a week ago or something after he's made one uh but that's an intensity about yeah. and, a, and a fire that burns within. I uh, love it. You know, he doesn't necessarily, because you know, he's got the, you know, the, the, that kind of golden boy look about him. Yeah. You know, he doesn't exude the kind of fire that some other athletes have, but have shown, but he has it internally every bit as much as anybody else. And I think we saw that on full display when he had his struggles in the finals early and the way he was able to bounce back and help that team. I, I love his passion. Uh, absolutely. What are you doing these days? Uh, getting ready for the NBA. Yeah. So we'll be, uh, I think we got a real training camp next week for NBA TV. So I'll be in Minneapolis. Uh, and then we're going to start taping preview shows. And uh, you, you like so doing the shows? I love all of it. I love calling the games, doing the shows. It's all a lot of fun. I mean, did, it's a game of basketball. Did you know when you, when you were playing that you'd want to do this no, afterwards? No idea or clue at all. And to a certain extent, you know, you didn't look at it. Uh, as it being a career back then. I mean, I think more so today because you also have a lot more outlets. Look at what you're doing. Sure. You know, there are many more opportunities for, for one to get involved in sports uh, in terms of broadcasting. Uh, and then with the internet, the, the impact that cable television, satellite television has had, uh, the fact that when I was a kid, probably you're a little younger than me, but I remember the finals used to be tape delayed back in 1979, wasn't even shown live. Now there isn't a game that's played professionally in America that isn't on television. Right. And so it's just a live. completely live, a completely different animal. Uh, but I think it, it, it increases the viewer's value in terms of now you feel even more connected to your team or to your favorite well, player. And you, you don't have to go without, like I was putting my son, he's two years old, to sleep uh, a couple weeks ago and I was able to watch on my phone the the U.S. Open uh, yeah. finals, um, yeah. and and that was amazing because otherwise I would have missed that match, and I, I love it, and I you know of course I'm going to put my son to sleep, but right. I would have missed it, and I didn't have to because he was kind of asleep asleep, but I had to stay in a little bit longer, yeah. and I could watch the end of the final, so it was super cool. Yeah. All right, uh, the '94, you were on the team in '94, yeah. in uh, June 17, 1994 is the date. 
OJ goes on the chase. Um, they made a 30 for 30 about it. I watched the 30 for 30. It's the day that the Rangers uh, have their parade for the Stanley Cup. I'm at that parade. And then um, you guys are playing basketball at mm -hmm. night. Did you have any idea what was going on? I, they broke into the coverage. Mm -hmm. They did all this stuff. Um, did you or the, the, I think it was at the Garden, right? You yes, guys were at the, was at the Garden. Did anybody at the Garden have any knowledge? Yeah, everybody did, because one, they put it up on the big screen, the Jumbotron, okay. uh, and there was a buzz in the arena for an NBA Finals game unlike anything we'd ever experienced, because, you know, there was so many people in the arena talking about what was going up on, on Jumbotron, and then eventually we found out what was happening, and it was kind of eerie, because it's, you know, you think about it, you're playing in the biggest environment arena uh, experience of your professional career, you're playing for the NBA Finals. And your focus waned a little bit because there was so much focus on what was going on. Uh, it was it was just eerie. I'd never had an experience like that before or since. Uh, you know, when you're trying to win a championship. I mean, you imagine when the Cavs are playing the Warriors and all the attention was on this car chase within the arena. Because today, everyone would have had it on their phone. Sure. You know, but so I can't, it I was can't imagine, just really weird. I can't imagine that happening, and I, I, I have no idea why they did it, uh, you know, why they decided to put it up and why they broke into the coverage. I know uh, Costas was very upset. You yeah. see it in the 30 for 30. Um, and Brokaw thought they were doing the right thing. But to me, I'm not really sure why they broke into the game. Okay, if you broke in for the television audience, but at the arena. Yeah, that, I it, would agree with that. Like, I is. wouldn't have a problem with you breaking in for the television audience, but the fact that they broke yeah. in in the arena was a bit odd. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, revisionist history, I'm sure things might have gone differently had they known, but it was such a magnanimous story that had such far-reaching ramifications that people felt, in, you know, just engulfed in that moment. And you saw how it played out when you had the trial and all those other yeah. things. So I, I get it now. It was just weird to experience it. What, did Pat say anything to you guys? He must have said something because he had to know you guys had um, I, I seen think a glimpse. For the most part, we were still focused on the game. It was just kind of odd that yeah. the arena wasn't as focused. You know, well, the crowd wasn't as into it as they ordinarily What is it? Be. I love Madison Square Garden. I think it's the best place to watch any sporting yeah. event, especially during a playoff run, especially during a finals. Uh, I, I, I've been all around. I've never found that vibe, that, that atmosphere that you get. Would you agree with me? And what is it really like to be on that court at that moment, scoring a basket, grabbing a rebound, when the fans are going, when that building is shaking? I mean, that is Madison Square Garden. It kind of gives me chills to talk about. It. It's a lot like the way I would equate it is if you've ever gone to a Broadway play, it's like being on stage, you know, because the way that the, the arena's lit, you talked about the passion with which the fans approach the game. Uh, it, it creates an environment unlike any other. And I've played in a lot of great environments in the NBA. There are a lot of them, but there's just nothing quite like that. Then you factor in the celebrity. And, and, all, and the thing about our celebrities, a lot of them typically are New Yorkers. They grew up there. They are passionate fans of the team. So it creates a different environment. Uh, it was an awesome honor to have the opportunity to play in, in a situation like that. Um, last question for you, because I know you got to run. I yeah. really appreciate all your time, but just talk about this event, the John Starks Foundation, and, and what he does to give back and how important it is. John's got a heart of gold. He is one of the most special people I've ever uh, come into contact with. And one thing about John, that you won't ever find anybody, even those who've competed against him, that have anything negative to say about him. A guy gives his heart to this foundation, helps a, a, a lot of kids uh, with an opportunity to go to college and, and, and do some positive things. And you look at all the alumni that come back every year that the foundation has touched. Uh, I, I'm just really proud of him and his family uh, and what he's done. You know, he's adopted New York as his home. And obviously the, the city of New York has adopted him as one of their own as well. So it, it's, an, it's an honor to be a part of it, to see how it's grown each and every year, see so many familiar faces, uh, just really humbled that, that He's one of my best friends, uh, and I get to have an opportunity to come and spend some quality time with him. I love that you said that, and I love that you're still close to this yeah. day. I think that's amazing. The great Greg Anthony, what a great guy, and uh, just amazing to have him on the set here on Be Terrific. You're the Terrifics. You make Be Terrific special. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back with a whole lot more from the John Stark Celebrity Golf Classic in Greenwich, Connecticut. Don't go anywhere.